Now we're going to talk about some pediatric trauma since we spent an entire unit on adult trauma, okay, and an entire unit on adult medical, and we're going to get a day for all this pediatric stuff, right? Well, that's because there's not a whole lot of differences. Let's talk about some of those, okay? Um, this is the leading cause of death. You guys remember the age range? Trauma is the leading cause of death in all persons, age. You think it's not Stand by. Again. Okay. So, yeah, it's the leading cause of death in all persons age 1 to 44. So, technically, it's probably more different in children than adults? More what? It's more toward infants and children than adults? Because 1 to 44, if you say it's the leading cause in infants and children. Yeah, this is absolutely the leading cause in infants and children, hands down. Okay? Because they don't have the disease processes that we adults have, right? They haven't had the, you know, 30, 40, 50 years of greasy hamburgers, although we're working on it with McDonald's, right? <laughs> For the plaque buildup and stuff, okay? Oh, my God. I actually heard an accusation that McDonald's put, like, gel or, I don't know, something in their hamburgers. It's not my fault. It's McDonald's fault. Um, kinematics. So, blunt trauma is the most common cause of trauma, and that includes all your car accidents and whatnot, okay? Um, patterns of injury are different than uh, in adults. One thing you need to understand is while blunt trauma is the most common, penetrating trauma does still happen, and it's kind of on the rise, and it also depends significantly on your geographical location and how accessible are weapons and guns and knives and stuff, okay? So, motor vehicle crashes. Um, passengers unrestrained tend to have ne head and neck injuries, okay? And remember, they lead with that big old head. If they're unrestrained, they're essentially a projectile. I mean, hands down, especially depending on the, the age of the kid and the size, okay? Uh, restrained passengers tend to have abdominal and lower spine injuries, okay? And that's going to be even more significant if they're not wearing the lap belt appropriately, which is why they went to um, such a high age, uh, have to be in booster seats, because it's all about positioning of the lap belt to reduce injury, okay? <clears throat> Autopeds. Um, so these kids typically have abdominal injuries, thigh and pelvic fractures, and head trauma. Now, there are some considerations there. What are some of the considerations that I need to think about? A kid was hit by a car. Yes, absolutely. So adults, we see a car coming, we turn and run. Kids kind of get that deer in the headlight, and they turn to it and kind of freeze. How about size of the vehicle or what they were hit with? Because uh, my Suburban is going to make a lot different uh, injury pattern than, say, a Honda Civic. Okay? Sir? Is it unfair to have a test question that says a child is hit by a vehicle, where are those injuries? Where would that child sustain injuries? Isn't that somewhat unfair? You know how tall the child That's is? not kind of what they're going to give you. They're going to say... The last test, that's Did it say where are their injuries? Yeah. For what test? Yeah, fever and pelvis. Okay, so well, okay, so well, let me tell you why. So let's talk about this for a second, okay? Thigh, pelvic fractures, abdominal injuries, and head trauma. Okay, so here's what happens. I turn into the injury. Where am I going to get clipped? It's going to clip me either on my legs or my pelvis, right? Then what happens? A lot of times I come up onto the car. So either I fall onto the car or the car is so much taller it causes these injuries. Either way, why does my head get injured? Because they have that big head and it kind of leads the way whenever I fall. So, so even... You just described basically a whole body injury. But the first place is going to impact... I would, I would have to know the question. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to dispute a question randomly. Yeah. I, just, I, <laughs> I, I wasn't what I was. I know. Right. Yes, ma'am. Their head 
it flies this way is kind of what I would it's imagine. Not really, it's really it's really yeah, it's when they land. Their head leads. Well, it could be either. It kind of depends on how high the vehicle is. Okay, well, let's be honest. But typically, it's from hitting the ground. Imagine a watermelon thunking the ground. Well, I mean, I, I was just wondering where was it? Is the impact on the ground or is the impact on the car? Is typically, it's the typically it's the ground. Okay. Okay. All right, auto bicycles. Those are going to have abdominal injuries, head injuries, and spine injuries. Okay, abdominal because they hit those handlebars typically. Um, some other causes, uh, causes fall from height, so those typically are head and neck because remember they got the big head and the weight's going to be different. Okay, um, diving into shallow water. Who who is at high risk for drowning and dive injuries? Please. Adolescent males. Yep, hands down, adolescent males. They tend to be our risk taking category. Okay. Um, burns, of course, sports injuries, head, neck. Um, don't forget splenic injuries as well, right? So if you're out there working a football game, don't forget about the possible ruptured spleen if they have shoulder pain and they took a hit and you're kind of going, I don't get it, you got hit, but it's not the shoulder that you fell on kind of thing, okay? Be thinking about some of that. And then also child abuse, okay? Uh, head injuries. Uh, this is a common injury site. Okay, make sure the airway is open. Uh, don't forget, use a jaw thrust instead of head tilt chin lift because anytime there's a potential for head injury, you have to assume spine injury. Yeah, absolutely. Nausea and vomiting are super common, especially in kids. Okay, tongue obstructions are pretty common also, and then that simple thing can result in respiratory arrest. Okay. Chest injuries, remember they have those soft pliable ribs. Sir. They get that nuchal rigidity, so they can't, yeah. Yes, they can't do it. Also, you can lift their legs up, try to lift their legs up, and if they can't, it's because the meninges are... Like you bend it. Nuchal pain and rigidity. Mm -hmm. If you go, can you touch your chin to your chest and they, uh, with a high fever, it's meningitis no matter what, until proven otherwise. Okay. Um, children have those soft pliable ribs, okay, and then they can have significant trauma to their organs without actually fracturing bone. Okay, so they aren't likely to have those flail chest segments that you see regularly, right, because their bones are so pliable, but that doesn't mean they don't have significant injury underneath. But remember, they have decreased reserve capacities. They have, you know, um, higher need for oxygen consumption because of that metabolism, so it's going to affect them pretty differently for chest trauma. Abdominal injuries, these are typically more common in children than in adults, and this is a lot of the times source of a hidden injury. So if you've got a kiddo that you can't figure out why and they were involved say even in a minor car accident, you can't figure out why in the world, I say minor, how about moderate? You can't figure out why in the world they're showing signs of hypoperfusion, you better be looking at their belly. Okay? Can I ask you a question about that mild moderate car injury stuff? I've been on a couple of car wrecks, you know, doing, and I don't understand what they consider moderate and mild. Because I thought one that they said was moderate, I thought it was really bad. So how do you... Experience most of the time. But, I mean, what makes one something than the other? You know what I mean? Yeah, it is. It's a lot of personal judgment. You have to look at the damage done to the vehicle. Okay. That's what I look at, damage done to the vehicle. The damage done to the person is just the damage done to the vehicle? Or is it no, because they, they, call, they call that assessment before they ever get out of the vehicle. Okay. They, cause, they call and say, we're on scene, we have this many vehicles... Moderate, moderate, major damage, complete damage, whatever. Okay. So that's kind of when I get out, I go, oh, there's no visible damage here. It was a rear end at the mall. Okay. okay. Versus uh, a barrel roll or a T-bone or a head-on. Okay. Some of those are pretty significant. Okay. Okay. Um, so, again, always consider uh, any patient that's deteriorating, any trauma patient that had a potential. If they're deteriorating and you can't find any external signs, again, look at the belly. Um, 
Air from ventilations, again, can distend the stomach and interfere with ventilatory efforts. We already talked about that, so make sure you're cautious with that as well. Extremities. Uh, managed in the same way as adults, period. Okay? Now, orthopedic surgeons have a different purview because if they're close to uh, growth plates, which typically pediatrics fractures are closer to growth plates than adults because they have more flexibility and they're anchored well at the joints or at the, at the bone ends, okay? Um, trauma considerations. So do we use the mass pants or don't we? Use only if the size is appropriate and fits correctly. Um, do not place an infant in one leg of the mass pants. Um, and also, uh, if you have a pediatric patient that you decide to deploy mass pants on. So we're talking you have a very long transport time with significant injuries, um, and hypoperfusion, do not inflate the abdominal flap on a, on a pediatric patient because they rely heavily on those abdominal muscles. So if you essentially kind of encapsulate those, they're gonna, you're going to cause respiratory distress. Okay, Burns, cover them with the sterile dressing. Um, identify candidates with burn center. Have we already talked about burns? Yeah. I don't think I was here that day. Okay. We did a whole extra on burns. Yeah, I, I thought that was a night he was here. Um, so blood volume. The average newborn, so we're talking at 8 pounds, has 320 cc's of blood. Do you know how many cc's are in your Coke can? Hmm. So, a newborn has about as much blood as in that Coke can. So now what's 30% of it? A very little bit compared to 30% of our, how much blood volume do we have? Average female, <coughs> six liters, okay? So we have a whole lot more blood to lose, relatively speaking, because remember we talk about Percentages of blood loss is going to induce various stages of shock, right? Okay. Um, a little loss goes a long way. Okay, they can lose 20 to 25 percent before showing any noticeable signs of hypovolemia. That's, crazy. That's a quarter of that Coke can, right? How much do you think that is? Yeah, just. Just about, depending on how big of a gulp you take, okay? Small amounts, okay? Uh, and then hypotension does not occur until 30 to 40% blood loss. And then they're going to die almost very quickly after that. Look, I'm all about approximates. You're upwards of 40%. That's almost half of your blood volume, Okay. Um, so compensatory mechanisms, they're very efficient in pediatric patients. They really are. So what happens? The heart rate increases, and it is well typically able to sustain for a long period of time. Um, and then they vasoconstrict very well, which is where adults tend to not do that, and elderly people definitely don't do that. Okay? So adults can, can vasoconstrict some. They just don't have the quite the squeeze that those pediatric patients will get from vasoconstriction. Um, and they give up all those compensatory mechanisms pretty quick and crash fast. I cannot stress that enough. You have got to find the early signs of shock in a pediatric patient. I'm talking, we're talking early compensated shock. That's when you have to notice it. Trauma management. Again, uh, assure airway patency and position. Don't forget your jaw thrust is appropriate. Pat underneath the shoulders and make sure the spine is in line and that kind of stuff. Um, suction, when you need a suction, do so often as necessary. Use those large bore, okay, suction catheters. Would we still do a head tilt chin lift, not in reference to trauma, but on children? Like yeah, if there's no med, if there's no trauma, yep. Uh, okay. But you can provide, you can... Um, I just noticed a lot of it said jaw thrust. That's because we're in trauma. But I mean, even in some of the other slides... It's well, yeah, it says that you can do either. That, well, that's what I was asking. Yep, you can do either. All right, um, so provide high concentration of O2 and then assist ventilations if they're in respiratory distress or respiratory arrest or failure. 
Um, spinal mobilization may be needed. Okay. Now there's some controversy there. Okay. So is it going to make it worse or better? Are they easier to kind of convince to lay still, or do they get more anxious when you wrap them up? Okay. So there's some there's some consideration there, but in the end, when needed, they need spinal mobilization or spinal motion restriction. Okay, and then transport them. Pediatric trauma is not much different than adults. Questions? None? You what? 